medieval and early modern silk road culture and global jewish history he is also an avid follower of hindi cinema and his articles on bollywood and globalization have been published in the hindustan times if you could have a round of applause please With him is Jayant Sen Gupta who is the director of the Alupur Museum in Kolkata and the former director of Victoria Memorial Hall. He taught history at Jadavpur University and previously at the University of Notre Dame. He is the author of At the Margins: Discourses of Development, Democracy and Regionalism in Orissa in 2015. These noble edifices, the Raj Bhavans of Bengal, Victoria Memorial Hall in 2019 and two books in bengali named itihash o samoshay samaj sanskriti rajniti in 2022 and hence fell hence shall darpan bangali honrir khobor in 2023 He has also co-edited the long history of partition in Bengal, event, memory, and representations in 2024. If you could give him a round of applause, please. And Priyadarshini Guha uh, is our uh, who will be in conversation with them is a gold medalist in modern history, and she is in charge of the senior school humanities program and the entire course. Scholastic activities at Indus Valley World School in Kolkata. Her vast experience of over 25 years in teaching and teacher training helps her to promote no- novel and creative approaches to teaching. With her multi-fa- multifaceted talents and love for the arts, she is able to steer students to explore varied venues of. expression through drama dance singing music and literary endeavors passionate about teaching she chose to make that her life force born into a family steeped in reading theater and cinema these influences have enhanced her work Im- enormously over the years welcome Good evening everybody and uh, thank you for being here at the East Gate Lawns for I think the last session of this evening of Colum and um, it gives me great pleasure to share this stage with two people that are much revered and looked up to in the world of history and history has been my passion I think I was born into it I had no choice but then I fell in love with it and it's been a lifelong love affair that continues and um, we are so very happy this evening that Jonathan Gilda Harris and he's told me to call him Gil so I'll keep to that he's here this evening to discuss his book the first firangis with us and uh, i found both the words the both the f's that were juxtaposed next to each other very interesting first and then the firangis so uh, jonathan i would like you to throw light on what prompted you to write the book firstly and then give us i mean the audience i would imagine largely most of them have not read the book so if you could tell us a little more about what the book contains thank you priya darshini thank you joint it's superb to be here uh, in kolkata uh, i'm a little bit uh, humbled and embarrassed to, to be described as someone revered in history circles because i'm not a historian i'm a literary scholar so i'm a little bit of a sort of rank hobbyist uh, when it comes to to writing histories but in this case this was a history in which i i had a deep investment as a migrant to india uh, who was trying to wrestle with uh, uh, a number of challenges uh, about uh, adapting to a new culture a new set of languages a very new landscape uh, the first farangis let me deal with farangis first <laughs> so i could have written about uh, the first europeans in india or the first people not from the subcontinent in the subcontinent which would have made for a far less snappy title but the word farangi is one i'm interested in uh, and i know it's one that uh, can sometimes make people feel a bit uncomfortable 
I remember many, many years ago in Washington, D.C., when I was learning Hindi, or when I was learning what my Hindi teacher called Hindi, but which I subsequently found out was a language that no one has ever spoken, because it was so Sanskritized, even Doordarshan would have had difficulty understanding what she was teaching me. Uh, but uh, I remember one day she asked me, why did you say that in Hindi? And, and I said, Kyunki me firangi hung. And she went, oh! And I thought, uh oh, what have I done? She said, Vo shabd. Vo shabd galat hai. And I was thinking, which one? I said, Kyunki me? Oh, firangi. Oh! Sahi shabd videshi hai. And for her, that was the sahi shabd, the right word, because it was supposedly indigenous. She shuddered at the word farangi because to her ears, it sounded not only pejorative, she said, why would you want to call yourself that word? Uh, but it was also for her a word that came from elsewhere. It wasn't a should Hindi word. But that's precisely what interests me about it. The word farangi is like what it describes. It's a word that has migrated from elsewhere to the subcontinent and somehow become desi, even as it is not fully desi. Farangi is uh, a word that derives from an Arabic mishearing or an Arabic rendering of what the French called themselves. And they suddenly turned up in vast numbers in uh, uh, the Middle East uh, during the time of the First Crusades. The, the Arabs called them Ferengis. Ferengi migrated to Persia and became Firangi. Firangi migrated to the subcontinent. It was picked up in Urdu, in Hindi, in many languages. Uh, in Bengal, it has developed into Ferengi. <laughs> and I'll talk about that more soon. Um, in the south, in uh, Tamil Nadu, it's become Parangi. It's migrated even further afield to Malaysia and then to Samoa, where it's, where it's become Palangi. Um, but it's a word that keeps sort of acquiring new lives and new locations, just as these Farangs that it uh, describes have not remained consistently one thing through their migrations, but have kept sort of acquiring new meanings, uh, new affiliations, new senses of themselves. Uh, so the word farangi is one I'm very invested in. I'm happy to describe myself as a farang. First farangis. I was interested in writing about non-Europeans who came to the subcontinent before the age of colonialism. And that's because I felt very strongly there's a way in which colonialism has absolutely colonized <laughs> not only India, but the way in which we think about any non-European who has taken up residence in India. There's a presumption that uh, anyone who came from Europe or other parts of the world uh, and settled in India arrived here with malicious designs of some kind. They were seeking to conquer, to control, uh, to make huge amounts of money at the expense of uh, uh, the people who lived here, to dismantle the glorious culture uh, as if there was only one uh, of the subcontinent. And the people that I was looking at uh, were anything but conquerors or colonists. Uh, they were often what we might describe, using an anachronistic uh, term from a later uh, movement within history, subalterns. Many of these people were lower class, illiterate. They were trying to escape persecution in Europe, religious persecution in particular, in some cases, even sexual persecution. Uh, Many of them arrived in India as slaves or as indentured servants. Uh, they served Indian masters. Uh, and they were certainly not yet part of larger organizations like the East India Company. 
uh, although I'm writing about Europeans who came uh, after the Estado da India of Portugal had been set up, they often had uh, often very peripheral relations to uh, these sort of larger imperial and colonial entities. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, first Ferengis who precede what we assume to be true about Ferengis, uh, which tends to derive largely from a colonial epoch. And I'm interested in Ferengis from that period because I think it can help us unthink some of the assumptions we have, not only about migrants to India, uh, but about India itself. Uh, and I think there's a way in which India has been articulated increasingly almost as a reaction formation against colonialism, which is completely understandable given the heavy weight of colonial history and what you can see behind me here, uh, uh, the monument of the British Raj. Uh, but I think we need to get outside some of the colonial understandings of uh, identity, whether Farang or Indian, in order to better understand the complexities of culture, uh, of dialogue between peoples, uh, of the extraordinary complexity of India itself. Uh, I think despite all the talk of decolonizing India that uh, we're hearing right now from the right as much as from the left, uh, there is a way in which the talk of decolonizing India still inhabits a colonial paradigm uh, of Indian identity, a singular Indian identity that must be purged of any trace of foreignness. Uh, so that's a roundabout answer to why first and Farangis. Uh, not roundabout at all. I mean, that's what makes it fascinating. Uh, the next thought that I wanted you to shed some light on, and when I was going through your book, I mean, that's what was so interesting, was that, you know, uh, as you mentioned just now, that the characters you draw upon or the talk, I mean, those you talk about, they are not so simple and there are so many fascinating layers that we find. And, you know, this intermingling of the cultures that is happening and the way things are sort of merging or getting purged. I'd like you to comment on that a little because that is what makes it so exciting. And this fact that there is not, no singular identity. I mean, identities are getting merged, new ones are being created. So if you could comment on that a little. Well, maybe it would be useful if I give an example very close to home here. Um, this is uh, a Ferrang named uh, Sebastian Gonzalez uh, Tibau. And as you can guess from his name, he was born in Portugal, uh, probably in the 1580s, uh, probably about 1582 or so. Uh, we know very little about Sebastian Tibau, uh, uh, Sebastian Gonzalez Tibau. Uh, like so many of the Ferengis in the book, he was almost certainly illiterate. Uh, he left really no trace in the historical record that he had written himself because he couldn't write, uh, whether in Portuguese or any of the other many languages that he would have had to learn uh, once he arrived here. Uh, he, we don't know why he came to India. Uh, he was almost certainly born very to a very poor family in Portugal, a fishing village uh, just south of Lisbon. It's quite likely that he was press ganged to serve on a Portuguese galleon. Uh, but he found his way uh, from the Estado da India, which at that point encompassed Damanandu, Goa, uh, Cochin, uh, and a few uh, factory uh, towns on the Coromandel coast. He made his way to the Bay of Bengal and eventually to Chittagong, uh, where he worked independently as a salt merchant. And his trading partners uh, were very shady sorts. Uh, they included uh, Burmese uh, sailors, uh, Bengali sailors, uh, some Mughals. Uh, and um, Chittagong was at this time kind of stateless city. It was nominally ruled at uh, 
Interalia by the, the Mughals, uh, by the uh, Arakans uh, from Burma. Uh, but no one seemed to have complete dominion over it. And uh, it was one of these sort of port cities that involved an extraordinary multicultural array of people who were looking to make some kind of living. Uh, now, in about 1605, uh, the uh, Burmese raided Chittagong and drove out uh, many of the Portuguese who were there, including Sebastião González Tibão. And he and a flotilla of about 40 ships made their way out of Chittagong and washed up on an island uh, just south of the Sundarbans, part of the delta, the Brahmaputra and Ganga delta, uh, called Shondweep. It still exists today. Uh, it's about 125 square kilometers now. In those days, it was about 1,500 square kilometers. But the thing about Shondweep, like so much of the land in the Sundarbans, is that it has kept changing as a result of the extreme weather. Uh, just think of the volume of water pumping out of the river delta uh, constantly transforming uh, the precarious land uh, at its edges. Not to mention the heavy, heavy monsoon rains, the typhoons that uh, strike the, the region several times a year. It was not exactly an inviting place to make a new home, but uh, the residents of uh, Tabal's flotilla decided this is it. This is where we'll, we'll be safe. And uh, they decided semi-democratically to elect one of their own as their new leader. Uh, for whatever reason, he refused. And the second choice was Sebastian González Tibão. Now, this was not a singularly Portuguese group. It was a very mixed group that uh, included uh, Portuguese sailors, Bengali sailors, uh, some Burmese sailors. Uh, and Sebastian González Tibau was elected their leader, but proclaimed himself Raja. And he became known as the Haramadi, the pirate Raja of Shondweep. Now, several people had preceded him as Raja of Shondweep. Uh, there had been uh, Hindu Rajas, there had been Muslim Rajas. Um, and normally, if you are a Raja of Shondweep, life was brutal and short and your tenure was even shorter. Uh, people didn't last much longer than about three or four months as a Raja. It was a little bit like a Bengali version of Game of Thrones. People were constantly plotting to overthrow each other. Somehow, Sebastian González Tibão managed to remain in power for eight years, which is an eternity in Chandweep. And during that time, he managed to expand his dominion to include the even larger island of Bola. And he became a major power in the region, uh, refusing to fall in line with the Portuguese who made entreaties to him saying, hey, fellow Portuguese guy, <laughs> uh, please make uh, your territory part of the Estado do India. He refused. At certain times, a little bit like Nitish Kumar, uh, he would uh, <laughs> make gestures saying, yeah, I could be your friend if you do things for me. Then he'd go to the other side and say, I'm your best friend. Uh, and it was through uh, the sort of Machiavellian political jugard, he managed not only to remain in power, but to marry the sister of the, um, the equivalent of the Raja, uh, of the Irrawaddy deltas, uh, the Burmese Raja. Uh, and with her had um, a child, also named Sebastian González Tibão, um, who grew up speaking Burmese uh, and identifying as Arakan. Uh, he in turn had a child <laughs> named Sebastian González Tibão. Uh, that Portuguese name remained a constant, and so did the nominal uh, alliance with Christianity. Uh, but eventually these people were driven off the island uh, because they were enlisted by the Mughals uh, to help retake Chittagong. And Shaista Khan, the Mughal, uh, offered the descendants of Sebastian González Tibão, who by this time were 
part Portuguese, part Arakan, part Bengali. He offered them a plot of land in Dhaka, uh, which came to be known as Ferengi Bazaar. And there's also a part of Chittagong just next to the port called Ferengi Bazaar, where there's still a cathedral. And there's still people with names like Pereira and Oliveira, whose skin is as dark as the night, who are Bangladeshi, who speak Bengali, uh, but are descended from Sebastian Gonzalez Tibau. These people for a long time were identified by the British Raj as a separate ethnicity, and they were regarded with absolute condescension as an example of what happens to Europeans when they racially fall. Uh, but uh, I think the story of the Ferengis is a fascinating example of how we need to think outside of a colonial mindset in order to get a handle on a tale of miscegenation, of cultural heterogeneity, that rather than being exceptional is much more the norm in the subcontinent than it is simply a crazy story. Uh, I think that's trigger enough for you to pick up a copy and read it because of just this one little story that we've heard from Gil. Uh, I want to bring in Jantuda here, you know, because uh, as Gil said, he's not a history person. He's a literature person. But the historian's perspective is very vital, I think, because of all that you have related. So Jantuda, your thoughts, please. Uh, <clears throat> sure. Uh, well, I, I can't say I have... I have read the book, I have just uh, quickly browsed through it, but I have a feel for it and I have, I have read quite a few of the fascinating stories that Gil uh, brings into focus. Now, as a student of history, I think there are quite a few things which are counterintuitive uh, that the first Firangis does. One is the general idea, and Gil has already spoken about this, and you know this, because, and as we know, as citizens living in these unfortunate times, we are always willy-nilly, we are involved into a battle for the idea of India. And um, as you know, there is a, there is a strong group which tries to argue that India or the concept of Indianness, who is an Indian, who is not, or who should be counted as an Indian, who shouldn't, these are defined by a very unitary, exceptionalist, self-contained idea of India, as if, as if India has always been a bubble uh, and it has not borrowed anything from anywhere. Uh, and, and that is, that is, there is a quintessential or as, as you know, authentic, within quotes, idea of India and everything else is an aberration. Uh, <clears throat> now, even without bringing Gill's book as a student of history, uh, we will, uh, we, we actually know that this is, this is a, uh, you know, for lack of a stronger word, I will say that this is just incorrect. It's a very antiseptic word that I'm using. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very incorrect imagination of India because India has shamelessly borrowed things from all over the world. And over time, those borrowed things have become projected as prototypically authentic. Um, I have written a few pieces here and there about the culture and politics of food. So I'll give you an example from food, uh, what is Indian cuisine, Indian food? If you look closely, you will find that two quintessential ingredients, among others, but the two iconic Indian food ingredients are the potato. We are the largest consumers of the potato in the world. Uh, the Irish eat more potato per capita, but we are like, you know, 287 times or, or thereabouts uh, the population of Ireland. And uh, chilies, Indian food is hot. You know, the sahibs or Firengis love it. 
but they also cry, they also weep when eating hot food. Not gill, you are exempted. You have... <laughs> but you have developed a taste for it. But potatoes and chilies, both of them came from the new world. They are not indigenous to India. So, just like food, I mean, we have borrowed things without inhibition from all over the world. And what Gill's book does is to argue very powerfully, uh, very persuasively, as I find as a student of history, is about the fluidity of the idea of India as if the Indianness or the, the uh, you know, the, the fact of being an Indian is always sort of a dynamic, a fluid process. It's, it's a process always in the making. In the making so that it is redefined and reimagined and reprojected all over again every single day. So, especially in these times when there is a battle going on for the idea of India or the soul of India or what is authentically Indian, I think Gill's book is a, is a critically important corrective to unitary and exceptionalist ideas of, of India. So that's what it, what it does. Uh, as a student of history, I think, and we all know this, there was a time till maybe about 25, 30 years ago when Many civil India, Indian civilization, India as a subcontinent was largely considered, especially in the Western academia, in large parts of Western academia, with exceptions, as something back of beyond, as something unconnected with the greater forces of world history. But Europe also was viewed as something of an exceptionalist civilization or, or Western you know, the, the Western world, which is why a few decades ago, many universities in the West, history departments, had courses called the history of the Western civilization, or Western Civ, as it was, uh, you know, called uh, in brief, from the Renaissance to the First World War or Second World War, or whatever. Now, as the realization dawned over the last few decades that the history of the world is connected and, and you, you cannot have these exceptionalist insular histories, gradually many of these Western Civ courses gave way to global histories or world histories. This has happened much more strongly in histories of the Western Hemisphere than for South Asia, for the Asian uh, continent in general. Uh, but what Gill has done is to bring into focus the connectedness and the huge traffic of people, ideas, commerce, uh, adventurers, and drifters in a broadly Asian world in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. And this is an Asian world because, as you, as you all know, in 1453, with the, with, with the fall of Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Byzantine, Eastern Roman Empire, uh, to the Ottoman Turks, Europe had some sort of an enemy at the gates. It is a time when the continent of Europe is being threatened with being overrun by, by Ottoman Turks and other Asian powers, especially Muslim powers. If you look at that Ottoman Turkey in the second half of the 19th century, it has become a sick man of Europe. But in between the 16th, 17th centuries are really a history of the great Asian empires. The Ottomans in Turkey, the Safavids in Persia, the Mughals in India, the Ming and the King in China, and so on and so forth. What Gill's book does is to bring the connected, interconnected nature of this Asian world and to highlight on characters who would be otherwise lost to history forever because they are very rarely uh, mentioned in the traditional archives and which is why the subtitle of his book, the first Firangis, a history of, you know, uh, adventurers, 
charlatans, drifters, and so on and so forth. Gil, I, you know, I, I, I don't exactly recall the subtitle of the book. So he, in a sense, not only rescues these people who are subaltern characters in a broadly Asian but deeply connected world into focus and therefore expands the frontiers of these global histories for Asia. But he also uses the biographies of these characters and the experiences of these characters to contain about the essential deep-seated plurality of Indian identity, the dynamic and fluid nature of Indian identity as an Indian identity which is always in the making as, experience, as, as indicated by the struggles of these people and their success to relative degrees, various degrees, of becoming Indians. And what he does, I will, I will, I will end this, in, in this with, with this observation that in the colonial encounter between Britain and India was marked also by a lot of writing, European writing about, British writing about what India was like, what Indian culture was all about, the essence of India. Uh, and as we all know, the British put a great deal of emphasis on a, on a divisive sociology of India by saying, by constantly harping on the fact that India had always been so vulnerable, so conquerable, so that it had always been conquered by so-called foreign Videshi powers. Uh, and therefore, it was just as well that the British uh, were now here to, to conquer India and to, and to bring in the rule of law and so on and so forth. And this was possible because of India's inability to unite for a common cause, the lack of a sense of a nation. India was all about communities, communities of caste, language, religion, region, and, and so on <clears throat> and so forth. But the Indian nationalists, they also forged a, a sort of a counter response to this by imagining an integrative sociology, uh, which is perhaps most uh, poignantly expressed in Rabindranath Thakur's poem called Bharat Tirtho, in which there is this line that, you know, shock, hold on all, hethai arjo, hethai onarjo, hethai dravir chin, shok hunodal patan mogol, ag dehe hololin. All the Indo-Scythians, uh, Huns, Mughals, they were all becoming assimilated in an India. So it was, it was a nationalist counter response of making India into the real conqueror or assimilator of the so-called foreigners who were not actually foreigners. Um, so I think Gill introduces an element of caution into this overall, so he modifies both the colonial argument about India's conquerability, also the nationalist counter response of being a kind of melting pot for all civilizations by saying that these experiences were always fluid and these people were becoming Indian, they were becoming Indian, but they, ha they were not really shedding their Firangi identities because the concept Firangi is capacious enough to incorporate and include all of these competing processes. So I think that's a, you know, I learned many things from uh, Gill's book, I, you know, my, my sense of history uh, as, uh, as, a, as a kind of, you know, as a person who believes in connected histories has been tremendously enriched and I am especially grateful to Gill for bringing out his book at this particularly fraught moment in Indian contemporary history. Um, I don't think it could have been put better because uh, we stand at a very, very difficult crossroad, I mean, where our nation is concerned. And uh, the way Dr. Sengupta put it, I think that really speaks volumes because, um, you know, this thing, uh, what I loved, and I would want to echo that and reiterate it, uh, this idea of India being the melting pot. We, we should accept that, we, sh we should understand that. And that is where I think, the, in my eyes at least, if I would want to express my opinion, the beauty of what emerges lies, rather than looking at it as something that has led to all the trouble that has ensued. And uh, oh, as you did put it, that you know, most often we have seen, at least 
you know, I speak from my experience of teaching in school primarily. You know, the history that is taught in classrooms is always a top heavy. We are only looking at it from the perspective of the rulers rather than the ruled. And that's where I think the this subaltern perspective in a way ma makes so much of a difference because, I mean, these are such real people and these they have such fascinating stories to tell for themselves. And as uh, Dr. Senkupta said, you know, it's so enriching to read. I mean, even that little anecdote you told us about Chittagong and the fact that you know, they are Bangladeshis today, they speak impeccable Bengali, yet they are a Pereira or so and so and so forth. So that is indeed fascinating. Um, I think it's a good time to open it up for questions because uh, we'd like to keep to time. So uh, anyone in the audience who would like to ask Gil a question or even if you would like to ask Dr. Sengupta something, you're more than welcome. There's too much of light in our eyes. Is the audience gobsmacked? <laughs> because it seems as if we've sort of silenced them after our discussion. Maybe, maybe uh, I can ask Gil. Yes, uh, why not? A brief question about his his. You know, his use of the archives, because as you have said, uh, these people are rarely, if at all, mentioned in the archives. So there is, a, there is a tremendous constraint for the historian, which have to be overcome somehow. And so how did you try to transcend the, the limited nature of the archives that was available to you? It was a huge challenge because every one of the characters I write about in this book, I would find some kind of trace in the archive, but it would be a trace in the sense of a vapor trail rather than something solid. Uh, so for instance, the only Firang that is mentioned in the uh, Jahangir Nama is someone who gets the name Hunarmand, which is of course the Persian word for skillful. And Hunarmand was a jeweler uh, who seems to have been responsible for, amongst other things, designing the Takde Tavus, the peacock throne, which has come to be seen as one of the emblems, or used to be seen <laughs> as one of the emblems of Indianness. Uh, if you go to Red Fort in uh, Delhi, uh, the story is narrated of uh, the, the Persian Shah, Nadir Shah, taking the peacock throne as an act of vandalism against India, that the peacock throne, as much as the Koh Noor, was something intrinsically Indian that belongs to us. So I love the idea that the Takti Tavus, the peacock throne, was designed by a foreigner, Hunarmand, who turns out to be a very shady character um, named uh, Augustin Unarmand, uh, who had run away from France because he was a counterfeit jeweler. And uh, he was uh, basically on the lam, as they say, running from the law. Um, he was also a very good talker, and he managed to talk his way into the Mughal community. Um, but beyond that, we don't have much evidence of uh, who he was, uh, what happened to him, etc. So how do you write stories that are literally constructed out of more or less thin air? So my principal archive ended up being something very counterintuitive. It was my own body. I think there's a way that when we think about migration, we are very much the hostage of René Descartes and a post-Cartesian age. Uh, we tend to think perhaps less in this age of mass refugees, but we have tended to think of the task of migration as largely involving uh, struggles of the mind. How does one adapt to a new culture? How does one learn a new language? And I knew from my own experience as a migrant in India, a migrant to India, that uh, Many of my struggles, which are paltry compared to those of the people I write about, 
After all, I was migrating to a very different India from the one they migrated to. I was able to migrate as an English speaker to a, an India where I could speak English much of the time. I was born in New Zealand with a rather temperate climate. Despite the heat of India, I was able to spend much of my time in air-conditioned spaces and cars and houses and so on. So my transition was relatively straightforward compared to those of a Sebastian Tabal uh, who had to deal with typhoons and uh, invasions, uh, not only geopolitical invasions, but invasions of mosquitoes. Uh, one presumes that in Chandweep, uh, he had to uh, deal with uh, the dengue or the forerunner of dengue. He was living with mosquitoes all his uh, time he was there. Uh, the fact is that uh, migration is a highly embodied act. And the body, contrary to the way in which we are trained to think about it nowadays, as something that is uh, static, that is epidermally fixed, you're white or you're brown or you're black, you're tall or you're short, <laughs> the body is very adaptive. And the body has to adapt in order to survive. So one of my favorite stories in the book is about someone named Patri Guru, uh, who lived in Rachol in Goa in the uh, late decades of the 16th and the early decades of the 17th century. Despite his name, Patri Guru, uh, he was from Europe. And he'd been previously called Thomas Estevan. But he wasn't from Portugal because he had been born as Thomas Stevens in England, uh, just a few years before Shakespeare. He was a committed Catholic at a time when it was very dangerous to be Catholic in England. And he fled for his life first uh, to Rome, then to Portugal, and then he hopped on a boat to Goa, and then migrated from the city of Goa to Rachol, right at what is now the border of Goa and Karnataka. Now, on the ship to India, he fell terribly sick, not with scurvy, which was the affliction of uh, many sailors who uh, didn't eat fruit for months at a time, but with heat exhaustion. And like many people suffering from heat exhaustion, uh, he was throwing up, suffering from dysentery, and he almost died days after reaching Goa. The Portuguese doctors couldn't help him. But a local Hakim gave him a nariel and said, here, drink the pani from this nariel. He did, and within hours he felt better. And he devoted the rest of his life to being an evangelist, not for Jesus Christ, but for the nariel and its extraordinary powers of transformation. He wrote, it was wonderful. I don't know if any of you were here for Jerry Pinto and uh, Shanta Gokhale's session on uh, the uh, bhakti of uh, Vakari poet uh, Tukaram. Uh, so, <laughs> Thomas Stevens, Patri Guru, was very influenced uh, by a pair of bhakti uh, poets in the Vakari tradition, uh, Gnaneshwar and uh, uh, Eknath. And he became a talented poet in Marathi and Konkani in the Ovi style, writing abhangs. And he wrote a Purana called the Krista Purana, the story of Christ. But it's not really about Jesus at all. It's about the coconut and its extraordinary powers of bodily transformation. Interestingly, he compared Marathi to the coconut. He said, to feel Marathi on your tongue is like drinking Nariel Pani. It transforms you. It feels like a liquid. It makes me feel better. Uh, and this actually survives, this Purana. It was still recited by freedom fighters, interestingly, uh, up to 1947 on the Konkan coast as an indigenous uh, work of art that made them proud of Marathi. Uh, they had forgotten that it was written by a Farang. Uh, but it's a reminder that these chance encounters with fruit, landscape, heat, things that enter your body and transform your body also become the pivot points
that transform your whole relation to the world. This man wrote the first grammar book of Konkani. Uh, and uh, the first uh, few ovis, the first few stanzas of his Purana are an extended work of praise to the Marathi language. And they're not simply an act of kissing up to his Marathi readers. Uh, they're clearly the heartfelt expression uh, of someone who felt that his life was changed in a dramatically new environment uh, from the one that he had grown up in, the one that had also persecuted him back in England. So it's these kinds of experiences, my own experiences of heat stroke, by the way, um, made me resonate with Patri Guru. Uh, but so much of my adapting to living in India has involved struggling with uh, bodily experiences that have forced me to adapt in a variety of ways, some of them utterly mundane, even trying to adapt my palate to speak Hindi in a way that doesn't make me sound like Tom Alter in a bad 1970s Hindi movie saying, you know, Mardalo bastard call. Um, <laughs> The fact is, I cannot change my palate after close to 60 years of conditioning. I cannot uh, quite uh, get the difference between, you know, duh and duh and duh and duh. Uh, but over time, something in my palate has transformed as a result of having Hindi come out of it uh, for, it's now 12 years. Uh, so. This is an archive that I think is just as valuable as uh, the archives that we find in national libraries, uh, in the, the more formal archives that uh, historians conventionally work with. Uh, this is real learning because, I mean, we go to a library or to look for a source or we hear of oral traditions and we look at archaeological sources. But here, for the first time, thinking of the body as a source from which, you know, so much has been born and so much learning. So thank you, Gil, for telling us this bit because that's truly fascinating. Uh, there's a question here in the first row. Oh, no. It's not a question, actually. I would actually like to, like to add to what Mr. Gill was saying. Maybe DNA testing could also add to that. I would uh, share, like to share a, a very recent experience I had in, in London. I was going by taxi. I had a Bangladeshi driver who was driving me to Heathrow and it's a one and a half hours journey, so we got talking. So he told me that he was from Silhet and settled in, 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 uh, in, in, in London. So I do have a lot of people in my office working, I mean, who, who speak Siliti Bengali. So I said, oh yeah, you just write across and your Bengali is very familiar. We got talking and talking and then he said, where are you from? I said, I'm a South Indian Tamilian, now working in Calcutta. He said, you know what? I got my DNA tested. I am a Tamilian from, from the South, but I'm now a Bangladeshi, so I recommend you get your DNA tested. So maybe that will help. Thank you for sharing that. That was really delightful. Uh, any other thoughts? Any other questions? Uh, Ma'am here in the first row. Thank you. This was a really wonderful, wonderful session. And I must tell on myself a little and maybe reveal my own biases. When Gil began, I thought, oh, it's too early to excuse, <laughs> make any excuses for colonialism <laughs> or try to find an alternative uh, interpretation. But it was an enlightening session. So I'm glad to say that I've moved away from that uh, initial thought. Um, I guess in light of not just politics in India, but worldwide, how do we negotiate, you know, as a historian, uh, as an academic, how do we negotiate this need or desperate desire for whatever we think is authentic to hold on to that, to claim something as our own, that this is Indian or we're Bangladeshi actually, so this is Bangladeshi or whatever it may be, that core authentic identity. How do we negotiate that desire, which is quite natural in, in many instances, even if it is illogical, um, with this idea of multiplicity, which can only enrich, which can only, you know, uh, open our minds to, to other worlds and, and cultures. Do you have a solution for this? I, I'm sure Jointo has things to say about this, but I, I, 
just say at the top of my head, um, very quickly, what does it mean to say something of our own um, and equate that with a singularity? Uh, I, I think there's a way in which uh, uh, the word own is, of course, linked to ownership. And uh, we are sort of very possessive of identity, uh, but in a way that uh, actually commits violence against the messy truth of how we live in the world. Uh, and that uh, uh, rather than owning our multiplicity, <laughs> I'd want to sort of surrender a little bit uh, the idea of ownership. And here I'm instructed by Indian languages. There's no verb for to have in Hindi or Bengali uh, or in many Indian languages. Instead, what we have is mere uh, pas, something is next to me. And I rather like the idea of proximity rather than ownership as a way of thinking about who I am that I am not simply a singular um, lineage, uh, which is so often conflated with a father's surname, that I belong to this clan, which I inherited from my father, but I am also what I am next to, Pas, Nazdik. I remember being very moved when I heard a friend of mine um, who grew up in Nizamuddin in Delhi, uh, she is her, herself of mixed origin. She is, her mother was from UP, her father from uh, Tamil uh, Brahmin stock. And she was often asked, you know, what's your own identity? And she'd say, well, that's a difficult question. I could say I'm a Tam Bram. I could say I'm from UP. But in fact, I'm equally from the Darga because I've grown up... <laughs> next to the Nizamuddin Darga and the sound of the Kavals there is just as much a part of who I am uh, because of my everyday proximity to it. For me, that is both deeply moving but also resonates. Who am I to say that my identity stops right here because my DNA has nothing to do with you? I think every conversation I have with someone who I'm not imprints on me in some way and transforms who I am. And conversely, to some extent, transforms you. But I'd like to think that uh, some of the solutions to problems that, as you've described, seem natural are actually problems that are, the solutions are closer to hand because these problems are, in fact, very embedded in different syntaxes of thought uh, from the ones that we've grown up with. I often laugh at that line, you know, <laughs> mere pas ma. Um, but there's a wisdom in that. Um, it's not only ma, it's mere pas subkuch that I'm next to. Um, so I'd like to think we could be a bit more generous in thinking about our identity rather than looking to always partition sequester and purify identity. Uh, if I may just add one thing to what Gil just said. Uh, you know, this thing about, I have to endorse that, and I, I feel it very, very strongly, that uh, what he said, Amar kache ba amar paashe je aache, she to tatotai amari. It's, it's perspective. I feel it's all about perspective. It's how you're looking at things. And, you know, I feel again, I'm going back to that in the times in which we live, rather than wanting to encourage divisive tendencies, if we could be more cohesive and bring each other closer, I think we would be looking at a far better India. Absolutely. And... Um uh, Gil and Priyadarshini, you, you know, stated this so beautifully. I, I think one of the, it's of course easier said than done, uh, but to recognize and accept the fact that civilizations, all civilizations are porous and permeable. 
and we have all grown up in this way by you know by by taking things from others and from you know by by giving things to to other civilizations and all these civilizations have grown up this so all are in the process of becoming something else uh, so it, it i don't know i mean if 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 everybody could embrace this ideal i don't know how it's possible especially in today's world i'm not only talking about india then it would become much easier to 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 you know leave with this this fact um yeah so that's it all all civilizations are are like that they're they're porous they're they're permeable and we we are really we we can't really distinguish which part of us is shaped by which cultural ingredient from which civilization it's impossible so if i just may close this beautiful session uh, by quoting the bar, the bard the person who i think enriches us every single moment particularly here in kolkata and bengal i want you to leave with this thought that amar je sob dite hobe she to ami jani i have to be able to be more giving i feel in the times in which we live and that will i think generate a better path for all of us rather than you know wanting to be oh i am so and so and i believe in so and so and i have to be this i think we have to be far more giving and cohesive that's the only ray of hope that i see for our nation at the moment thank you everyone for being a part of this evening thank you gil and thank you join to the Thank you very much for uh, such an interesting session. Um, you can find a copy of uh, the first films uh, by Jonathan Hill Harris at uh, the book.